Cool. Uh, so yeah, thank you everyone for coming to our session on Mapathons. Um, the goals of the session are really just to talk about different ideas um, that people have around Mapathons that maybe haven't had that much airtime. Um, there's been quite a lot of discussion, I think, about Mapathons um, in the OSM community, and there's also a similar session to this happening at State of the Map um, that we're quite interested in, you know, seeing what we think and then taking it into the broader OSM um, environment. Um, so the goals are really just to um, take some of the great minds of Mapathons and Mapathon evolution um, and to um, yeah, talk about questions that people have around how we can uh, make Mapathons more powerful. Um, so um, first up, quick show of hands, just to gauge uh, where we're at. Um, is, um, has everyone in here, have you been to a Mapathon? If you have been to a Mapathon, raise your hand. Have. Okay, quite a lot of people. Okay, and if you haven't, raise your hand. Okay, cool. Um, have you led a Mapathon before? Raise your hand. Okay, roughly the same number that have been to Mapathons. Um, and um, do you like Mapathons? Yes, raise your hand. No, raise your hand. If you're like, yeah, I mean, this, this is, it'll hopefully come out in the discussion. If you're like in between on Mapathons, raise your hand. In between us. Okay. Um, any other questions you want to get a sense check on? Okay, who goes to the Mapathon to go to the pub after the Mapathon? Raise your hand. <laughs> actually, another one. I've been to a lot of Mapathons, but I haven't actually mapped in like, in a Mapathon in like three years. Um, so, okay, um, we're going to kick off with a couple of questions um, which are targeted at the expertise of different um, people on our lovely panel, um, and then we're going to open up to um, just questions from anyone, and this is really intended as more of a discussion, random ideas you've had, random challenges you have, um, possible solutions can come from any side of the room, so this isn't all focused on um, these lovely people. Um, but really quickly, if you can just introduce maybe yourself and um, what you're doing with regard to Mapathons, and then we'll get started. Um, okay. Uh, I'm Jorike Winke. Uh, I'm working for MSF, Mid-Sense of Frontier. Um, I'm based in the London office, and I'm coordinating missing maps from there, missing maps from Mapathons to field collection data and making our teams using the data uh, we are collecting. Um, so in relations to Mapathons, the closest relation is to the London Missing Maps community, where we have every month a large Mapathon and every month a small Mapathon with the experienced mappers, the small Mapathon. And then also further uh, within MSF, we also try to uh, help our teams and just uh, yeah, our MSF offices and teams and people who are interested um, to help them coordinating, m organizing Mapathons to get data. <laughs> I'm Emmer Nile and I'm a GIS Corps volunteer supporting the Tanzania Development Trust. Uh, Janet, raise your hand if you don't know her. And uh, I uh, set up the, the hot projects and uh, at this point, I've got about 50,000 tiles that still need to be validated, so I'm looking for help. Yes. Um, and I've been involved in uh, probably 10 different types of mapathons, whether it was a GIS days, a professional group, a lunchtime brown bag session, uh, universities, uh, professional societies. And uh, so it kind of surprised me how many different types of mapathons I've been involved in. Hello? Is that, okay, thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Gibb. Uh, I am the, uh, the voting membership chairperson for, for the HOT voting membership, um, and I also work at Maxar. Um, I've been, uh, similar to Emmer, I've, I've been to quite a few different types of mapathons, um, but mainly my focus uh, is on data quality and, and validation, so that's what I, I try to dig into and find ways that uh, either we as, as hot members or hot contributors um, can, improve, uh, can improve data um, 
not only through mapathons but through uh, individual contributions as well. Hello, I'm uh, Mikel Marin. I lead the community team at Mapbox. I'm on the board of the OpenStreetMap Foundation, and my current involvement in Mapathon are three ways. Um, we get asked to sponsor Mapathons, and so we will give some money for pizzas and drinks. Um, two, uh, we do organize internal Mapathons at Mapbox, so I try to find people who are excited about doing that and support them. And three, we deal with the results of Mapathons um, and how to deal with that data in our products. Hi, everyone. I am Shamila Nasazi, and I work with HOT in Uganda. I have dealt with Mapathons, uh, mainly organizing community Mapathons uh, in Uganda with our partners and the community people that we use for our trainings and data collection. Before that, I actually I also uh, organized my patrons at the university. Am my my first alumni? If there are any in the room, yeah. Thanks. Awesome. Um, thanks so much. Um, so as we said, definitely more discussion oriented. But just to kick off a couple of um, ideas and um, yeah, thought get the thoughts flowing. Um, we wanted to ask every panel panelist just one question. Um, so the first one is for both Eureka and um, Shamila, um, who have a lot of experience using internationally remotely generated Mapathon data in field projects. Um, so just asking them for a few reflections on um, maybe the pros and cons of, of that. Um, so Eureka, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so we are using a lot of, a lot of data. <laughs> um, so how, how it basically works within MSF is um, we work request-based. So our teams on the ground, um, so they, for example, our team, a team working in Burundi, um, that's, that's one of the situations we are now having basically, a team working in Burundi for a malaria outbreak, uh, malaria uh, campaign basically. Um, they're planning this, this, uh, this, this campaign on the ground and they basically want to know where every household is to be able to target it for spraying and for, uh, in their campaign. Um, so basically they, they, the, our team, our GIS officers on the ground, they see there is no base data, there is no baseline data, so they come to me and they ask like, okay, this is our problem, can you help us getting this data? Then basically I, we discuss about what is the exact area of interest, what kind of features do you exactly need, um, and then basically I set a task up on a tasking manager over the area they need. Um, I, try to, I try to set up this task as specific as possible, if we are asking for buildings, if we are asking for roads, if we are asking for... Um, um, yeah, and then basically I put them on the tasking manager, these tasks. So if it's high priority, I put them on high priority and they will end up on the, on the first page of the hot tasking manager. So it's really ready for everybody to, to start mapping. So it's there online. Everybody who wants to map on it can map on it. We want people to map on it. Um, and also we actively also promote certain tasks within Mapathons we are organizing or other people who are asking us for, hey, can we help you mapping on things? Um, yeah, let's organize a Mapathon for this task on this, on this task. So people start mapping and sometimes it goes incredibly, incredibly quick, um, which, is, which is super, 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 super nice. Um, sometimes it goes slower because of depending reasons, because the task is harder to do, because the the yeah, because it's just not the crisis where people are interested in, because it's uh, the mapping is the mapping is harder. It's in a dense environment. The satellite imagery is not good, so it really depends on on how how yeah on how the task is, how people start mapping on it. But then basically the result is we use this data. So as from the the data gets mapped. It's immediately on the map. We start using it in a lot of situations. So it's not that we wait for it to be completed. Sometimes in some, in certain settings, we will wait for the map, uh, the data to be completed. But other uh, settings, we will just start as from one building is added on the map. We just start using the data as from right now. It doesn't really matter that that some. Some, some things are not yet mapped or some things are not yet ready with validation because we desperately just need the data right now in, in some situations. Then something, having something is better than having nothing and not knowing where populations are or how to reach them. So we use the data, we use a lot of data. Um, the quality is not always as, as high as a real cartographer would wish, 
but for our operations, data is better than no data. In certain situations, like the one now in Burundi, we really need to have all the houses. So there, for example, validation is important and really checking up on the, on the data is important that we capture really every house um, in this area. So there, there is really a focus also on trying to get the outcome of this task as best as possible to be able to use it for really the purpose of every building in this area uh, to have. So this is one of our examples of how we use uh, data. But yeah, just for you to know, we use this data every day. I mean, data is created everywhere in the world. We just, we just use it in, in, in our operations. So, yeah. Thank you, Erika. Uh, so, for, for my case, uh, we use the data that we generate from the mapathons uh, in our field activities. We do a lot of field mapping, so in case uh, we need, say, to go to Western Uganda and we first check on OSM, what data do we have available? In case we find any data gaps, we, are go we create uh, projects in the tasking manager and request the volunteers to map uh, over our social media channels, and thankfully very many people respond. Uh, the biggest I think we have had uh, so far was we were trying to generate base maps for all the refugee hosting districts in Uganda. We had people contribute to over 11 districts and this data is not right now available for other partners as well as ourselves. So maybe my issues with, uh, I think, with mapathons is sometimes people, I think we mean well but we forget to tag things correctly. For instance, if someone tags a road as a major highway and you're in the field, the apps we use are going to send you to a smaller route. You know, it shows you on the map it's a very big road, so your car, can, your van can pass, but when you actually get on ground, it's a footpath. So I think we need to, there's a need to let the community know that People are actually using this data. Don't just come to the mapathon and trust things and you think that's the end. There's someone else who's going to use this information to maybe direct teams on the ground and yeah, use it for other maps and other things as well. Perfect. Um, so then the next uh, question we wanted to ask um, was to Mikkel and Imor, who both have quite a lot of experience in um, the creation and evolution of the mapathon, um, and asking kind of, do you think that's a concept that we need to improve incrementally, or do you think it's something we need to re envision and kind of replace with maybe a different a different thing? Um, and so yeah, just interested in, on your reflections and suggestions on those. So I have a question: um, How many of you have run a marathon? How much time did you train in order to run a marathon? Years. <laughs> when we mapped um, Haiti after the earthquake uh, in, in 2010, um, I would say probably everyone who contributed was already a, quite involved in OpenStreetMap um, for several years and, and quite familiar with, with how to do it and with the community. Um, now that's certainly in no way the only way that you are supposed to enter OpenStreetMap and HOT. Um, but I think um, we don't always in mapathons um, apply the, uh, or have a common understanding of the standards by which we expect um, and the kinds of results we have. There's a, many different objectives within mapathons. One is engagement, which I think is very valuable. Um, and then the other is data, but then as we've already heard, there's various forms of data. Sometimes just knowing where a house is, no matter how scribbled it is, is useful. Um, then there's OSM's actually relatively low standards. Let's not forget that OpenStreetMap is not like a bastion of geographic orthodoxy. Um, it's a wiki and things get improved, but there's certain like expectation for each step um, that, uh, as, at least as a starting place, which is well below what like professional data gathering and cartography expects. Um, so there's different needs uh, from different sets of users, um, and we don't all have the same sets of expectations. So I, for one, think we do need 
a fundamental rethink of how we do these events. Um, I'd even go, st I, I won't go this far, but I think maybe we should just change the name so that it really signals once we've gone through a, a process of like reevaluating how to do this so that no one is doing things wrong anymore. Because it's very, the genie is out of the bottle. It's very hard. How many mapathons are happening all the time? How do, and to what standard? It's very hard to manage. Um, but we need to really like fundamentally reevaluate. Re and um, my final thought on this, oh, leaderboards are actually a big part of the problem uh, here because it incentivizes as creating as much data as fast as possible. And that is a sure recipe for degradation of quality. So while I understand like the excitement of that and how motivating that is, I think we really need to think about better ways of evaluating the contributions. Maybe you don't get, a, maybe only after it gets validated do you get your points on the leaderboard if your data is correct because it's incentivizing um, uh, bad data and bad behavior. So I have a question. How many of you in your career path in front of you as you envision it have janitor as a part of that task that, of your career? I mean, do you, do you like to clean up toilets or pick up trash, rubbish, garbage? Not many people raising hands. I, I think that uh, when it comes to mapathons, that there, there's a corollary there. And the, I, I believe the terminology we use uh, probably needs to be better defined because I see validation as a Boolean choice. You can take a yellow square and you make a choice about it. You can make it green, yes, the data is valid, or you can make it pink, no, the data is not valid. The validation is not about the people, it's simply about the data. If you do something else like stop validation, then you're no longer a validator. And if you start editing, then you've become what? The janitor. You're cleaning up the poop that somebody else left behind as a part of a mapathon. So I would say that you know, the second part to validation is that it's not coaching. And I would, I would state that we should add the category for mapathons and even within the, the tasking manager of coaching, because coaching really is about working with the people and uh, Ralph was talking about the methodology they use in London to say, before you submit your tile as completely mapped, raise your hand and have a coach come and help you. So that, those are my, my two key things, is that validation is not coaching, and if you're doing cleanup, then you're not a validator anymore, you're a janitor. Okay, um, some varied opinions. Um, so then the last uh, question before we open up for um, thoughts and ideas from the audience is going to be f for Matt. Um, and if you can maybe spend just like 10 seconds on what a voting member is for the people that don't know. And then also um, there's quite a few voting members in the room and there's quite a few voting members who run Mapathons and are involved in Mapathons and what can they do to help, um, to help with that? Um, so a, a hot voting member uh, is a volunteer who has been uh, nominated by a current uh, voting member um, and they are involved uh, in the governance of the humanitarian open street map team. So they elect the board, um, they help uh, drive discussions uh, in the direction of the board, They've, they help write the strategic plan. Um, so uh, hot hot voting membership um, is really about the governance of the organization uh, through leading working groups and, um, and being uh, sort of leaders in our own local community um, as recognized by other, other members of the community. Um, so one thing I think that, uh, you know, members and uh, voting members and community members as a whole have, have started to do is, is really take some lessons learned from uh, how mapathons have evolved uh, over time. Um, I, I would argue that HOT would not have the reach it does today uh, and the global impact that it does today without um, sort of the evolution of, of mapathons or mapping parties, whatever, whatever the term is. I, I know my first edit in OSM was 
at a map mapathon in, in grad school five years ago. Um, and I'm, like, I'm still here having fun. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and at my State of the Map US talk uh, last year, um, I showed my first edit and it was, uh, as Imar put it, uh, garbage. Um, <laughs> and, it, and it's still there. So that, that's part of the problem though, right? The, the, um, there's not necessarily always someone looking over your shoulder. Um, and that mapathon I was at at the time uh, was, you know, a, a, a friend, a colleague who, who pulled it together, got us all mapping. Um, that was before ID Editor was ID Editor. Um, we had Jossum and it, there's quite a bit of a learning curve. Um, and, and, and so the, the main thing that I would challenge, uh, you know, voting members or, or non-voting members uh, at large is, you know, make sure we're, we're changing the way we look um, at hosting these events. If we're running mapathons the same way we were running them five years ago, um, that's, that's not good. Um, HOT has changed in the past five years. Um, we now have 189 voting members versus the 20 or 30 that were there only three or four years ago. Um, so it's a huge increase and it's a testament to um, the, the global work that HOT is doing. Um, but, but we need to always be on the lookout for um, new validation tools, um, new ways to, to reach to new mappers to get them that initial feedback. So I, I would actually disagree with what you said, saying that uh, validation is not about the mapper. Um, I, I would say it's, it's all about the mapper, um, because if we don't give users uh, that initial feedback saying, hey, this is wrong, uh, even if it's an automated message uh, in JOSM or ID um, saying, this is wrong, maybe you should fix it, um, then you know, they're, they're not going to improve and therefore they're going to keep creating uh, bad data. That's what the coaching is. <laughs> there was one really interesting question you brought up that I've actually never seen any data on. So with the sample size of this room, <laughs> put your hand up if your first edit in OSM was at a mapathon. Okay, so actually most people came from outside mapathons, I guess, in this space. Um, so yeah, now we just uh, wanted to um, yeah, open up for questions and ideas. Um, and Jennings is going to run a mic around and please wait for the mic to get for you so that the lovely people joining us online are able to hear. Um, so Tyler. Yeah. Hey, th thanks everyone. Um, one question. What does your ideal mapathon of the future look like? Where will it take place? What will people actually be doing in the mapathon? What devices will, we, will they be using? Thanks. All right. Let's take a couple of questions and then people can answer whichever one they want. Oh, yeah. I'll, ri I'll write them down. <laughs> You're going to ask a couple and then we'll And then you, you answer like one of them okay. each. Yeah. This is sort of more of a comment, but I wonder if like all mapathons should have validators in the room because then people are going to get immediate feedback uh, and also the data will get fixed. There was a study by someone, Martin Dennis, who's probably, maybe he's here, uh, where if someone gets the feedback like within an hour of their first edit, they're way more likely to return and keep mapping, which probably means they'll get better and continue to do good stuff, than if they get uh, feedback you know, within a few days or weeks or never, they probably won't come back. So I wonder if that's some way to contribute to good data quality and also retention of people coming back and, and doing more, is have people actually validating physically in that same room as the mapathon. Um, and one more for now. You can run down here if there's, oh, go there and then we come here afterwards. So uh, I would actually really love to run a mapathon, but I'm actually a beginner. I've made like two edits already. So, um, and I think that we, we tried to find people in our city who were also experts at this, and it doesn't seem, at least there's nobody here. That doesn't mean there's nobody, but there's nobody here. Oh, yes, there's nobody here. So if, um, I know it's, it's a, a remote community, a global community. Is there a way that we could bring in experts to give early and often feedback for mapathons, even if they're not able to be in the same city? Do you have any suggestions on how we can build that, especially if, you know, as somebody who would like to bring some people together to do it, I don't have the skills to say that's wrong because probably my edits were crap too. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So we're gonna, um, everyone can just pick one to respond to and then we had a bunch of questions down here so we'll come back. Um, so you pick one. Um, what is your ideal mapathon of the future? Um, practically, how could we get validators in the room? Um, and how can we bring in experts remotely um, 
in any which way. Um, Matt? Um, I'll, I'll take the first one. Um, I thought that was a really good question, Tyler. Thanks. Well, all the questions were great, so thank you for <laughs> and being involved. Um, the, the, this one really uh, piqued my interest, though. Um, the Mapathon of the future, um, as we've seen in a few talks uh, here, um, you know, ma machines are 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 kind of smart, but like they're they're also they they give you um, what you tell it to give you, um, whether that's flawed or or not. Um, so I think the mapathon of the future is 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 humans looking at data that's already been created uh, and sharing that with the community, um, be because we as people, um, we, we can make much better decisions based on looking at an image uh, right then and there. Um, actually, if, if anyone was in Rob's uh, talk about data ethics uh, just before this, um, he mentioned you know, find, finding ways to improve data um, that, that's already there. So you know, we could have a mapathon where instead of just tracing a road or tracing a building, uh, we're saying you know, the, the quality of the roof type or you know, the um, the the type of the road or the the material of the road rather um, you know it's unpaved we're, we're adding that additional attribution uh, to the data so that it's already a step above um, sort of sort of just an initial data extraction and creation and base data I want to answer the same question but just a quick comment that we want our goals at Mapathon should be to have folks like Matt and Maggie who come in first edit ever at a Mapathon we should be thinking everyone in that room is potentially uh, the chair of voting members or the executive director of OSM US. We should have very high expectations and really high hopes for the people in that room and really be designing things in that way. I think we should actually go back to the past uh, in the future and do what we used to call mapping parties where we would actually not just sit at our keyboards but go out into our surrounding neighborhoods, collect data, we used to do it on GPS units, but on phones, and come back and edit to, together and do it very, very closely. By design, that's gonna, that has to be a smaller group, but it results in people actually, I think there's a lot of people who come to Mapathons who don't even, who don't get a sense of the scope of the project or even realize that the data that's in OpenStreetMap is actually being used um, just from their local neighborhood. Um, and I think getting connected to, to that experience um, as the first introduction, or if you're organizing a regular event, oscillating between doing something remote and then something only local, I think would really broaden the horizons of the people who are being introduced to HOT and OpenStreetMap through, through these engagements. And, and, so we have Andrew's question. And, yeah, you have I'll, three questions. I'll, I'll take the third question about um, having a, a validator. I've supported multiple mapathons remotely from in different uh, time zones, even, and uh, it, it can be a little bit stressful. But the way I would work is you could um, share screens and just as you would looking over someone's shoulder, or you have uh, the Mapathon participants save their data set and then uh, you look it over and then give them feedback directly. And uh, it, it's, it's pretty stressful and I would say it's doing it alone is, is kind of frightening, but uh, you don't have to have necessarily have someone in the room to do that, that type of support. I'm sorry? How did people find me? Um, <laughs> or similar. Uh, well, I, I'll blame Rebecca. Uh, she pointed me to a, a, um, a corporation that was doing a mapathon that was, I was in one of their offices and then they had several satellite offices hooked up. And then the second one was through a GIS core. There was a, a university that had a, a class in GIS that wanted to have a, a focus on OSM, and so they did a mapathon as part of the class. Just adding on, where do you find those people? On missingmaps.org, there is a map where there are experienced mappers putting themselves forward to give you support in person or remotely. So pick a person there, and then there would be somebody around. You can pick somebody from 
Australia also to just have a nice chat with somebody from Australia. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's on the events page if you scroll right to the bottom, that map. Um, Shami? Oh. We have Andrew's question. Yeah, can, can I? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I wanted to react on Andrew's question about validations, uh, validators in the room. So in London, in the London mapathons we do, uh, we do have a group of beginner mappers, a group of JOSM mappers, and a group of validators. What we, so I, I like the idea, the, the real idea, but what we see in, happening in London uh, from experience is that there is only a small, small, there are only two, three people really doing validation during a mapathon with 70 participants. So this is just not, they are just not able to cope with the, with the high number of people people mapping. So I do like the idea. Um, the, the best thing is still like, I, I do, in, in, in theory, I do like the idea, but the, yeah, it's still not really working out. Also because people are sitting behind their computer and the validators are sitting behind their computer. So there might be some messaging from one computer to one computer, but still the best feedback is still the personal, the personal feedback. That's also why I really like this latest idea, which was coming from Ralph, about okay, the um, let's let's just if you have mapped a square, raise your hand, and then it's really a person coming to you and help you validate your square. So there is immediate feedback uh, in that way. So this is something we start to experiment now with in London, and we're I'm really curious to see how how this will go go forward. So validators in the room, but better like real personal validators than just clicking validators. Yeah, that's an amazing idea. <laughs> I think maybe just, just to add uh, what Shurika said, if you are organizing a mapathon and you're waiting, like maybe looking for validators and maybe like the local OSM experts in your community to contribute, if you say maybe send out a tweet or something like that, some, I'm very sure someone is going to reach out to you. And maybe also to encourage the, when you're organizing a mapathon, like in the mapathon itself, you should try to buddy up like the new mappers with the old mappers to make sure that we do not leave them behind. I know it has happened to me before, sometimes you will find yourself tiptoeing around the new mapper, you don't want to frustrate them so much. I mean, you want them to come back for the next mapathon. So, but it's also important to emphasize that the quality is needed, like, my panelist mentioned that we have to, we need to have high expectations of our new mappers as well. Thanks. Can I can I just add one quick thing? Just responding to like a ratio of seventy new people to three validators or more experienced people, we should have the discipline to like not have seventy people. Like if it becomes too many that we cannot manage in the way that we want it to be done, we should find ways of limiting those numbers, whether it's we have a sign up and you know there's a certain number, you have to declare your experience level and there's a certain number of slots. Of course, not all those people show up, but you choose a number where you, with a certain amount expectation of attrition, cor correlating to the amount of experienced people and validators who actually manage to do a, a good event. Um, I think Andrew had a quick comment and then we can run the mic down here because there was a group of questions. Um, so. Yeah, I, I think all these are, are good ideas and like nice solutions and stuff like that. And but a lot of them like I've never heard of before, you know. And I've done a lot of mapathons, I've led mapathons, validation, whatever. Like, how is there some way to get people who are a brand new mapper or want to run a mapathon to know all of this stuff and make sure that their validation has coaches and they know where the tools are, they know where the map on the website is, and they know where all these things are instead of just oh I'm going to get a room and do some mapping and it's neat. Like, how do you make those those people who run the mapathons who are brand new to everything and maybe aren't humanitarians, right? How do you get them to do like an awesome job? What's the best way to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was kind of the point of having this session in a way was get those ideas, but I definitely agree that there needs to be like a way for you to learn that if you're already hosting um, a mapathon. Um, yeah, a lot of this falls into me for it's like, you know, what's the best thing about OpenStreetMap? Anyone can edit. Like, what's the worst thing about OpenStreetMap? Anyone can edit. And, um, <laughs> like, you know, it's a beautiful thing, but clearly we need to control it a bit more. Um, so, okay, let's take three questions and then um, respond again, and then we can go back. Hi. Is there already a conversation with all the awesome organizations hosting mapathons where we can share all the materials being created? 
um, and all the tips and tricks. And so that way we have a really effective strategy on how to recruit and retain members. Um, Maggie had one, and then Ralph, and then. I'm going back to the, to the first statement Mikhail made about data and <coughs> engagement being our objectives of a mapathon. And do you think it's time we think of our, uh, rethink our objectives? Uh, because to me, it seems that those two objectives are really conflicting, that we're not going to get engagement and quality data at the same time. So maybe setting those goals ahead of a mapathon and thinking what you want to come out of it. Is it education? Is it engaging new mappers? Is it mapper retention? Just kind of a thought there. Hi, my, my question comes back to um, <clears throat> the future of mapathons, and uh, Matt and Mikkel um, touched on what I'm going to ask now, and I think you've also touched on what I'm going to ask now. Um, previously, when, when mapathons first started, uh, we, I, I, I remember, and I think many others might remember, that we actually trained the mappers on everything and taught them buildings, roads, waterways, land use, and went through the whole gambit of teaching them how to map. Um, <clears throat> mapathons have evolved further down the line and have changed, and <clears throat> the actual projects that are being created have changed. And the projects coming forward now are things like buildings only, or buildings and roads, or roads only. And the mapathons that are created are to try and clear those projects. So people at mapathons get trained just on buildings instead of the whole gambit. Now, it's validator level. I'm seeing the effects of this. And the, 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 hap, the happening is that people are becoming advanced mappers, but may never ever have drawn a waterway or a land use. Um, uh, at best, you, they've done some roads and lots of buildings. And we've got a lot of advanced mappers who are only buildings. <clears throat> um, is it time to, to, to have a look at mapathons and change them back to training people to map everything in relation to each other and in alignment with each other rather than training them just to do buildings to complete a project? Uh, ben, did you want to quickly add? Or Oh, okay. Well, it was just because I think this might be our last round and then we're going to have to continue this at lunch because um, if we miss lunch, we might get um, unpopular. Um, so your three questions, <laughs> pick one of them. Um, and if we go quickly, we can do another round. Um, so one of them, having a conversation about OpenStreetMap, Mapathon, best practices between everyone involved. Second one, um, should we have different and broader objectives or perhaps different objectives for each Mapathon? Third one, are we teaching people too simplistically? Um, so maybe, Eureka, you could kick us off? Um, sure. Um, I think I'll pick on, on uh, your question, Maggie. Um, because already in, in, in London Mapathons, we actually, yes, one end, data for me is really a goal to get data. Um, but on the other end, also community. Uh, the community spirit, the, the long-term engagement, the, the, the more than mapping. At our mapathons, people are coming without they want to map. They, they come because they want to be part of the community, they want to discuss, uh, they want to... Janet is one of these persons, for example. <laughs> she, she, she just comes and joins and, and chats and eats pizza and presents her project. And, and that's important. And that's for us, for me, that's these are the two data from my end, preferably high quality data, but uh, the community is the most important because also in that way you can sustain and engage mappers. It's only like when they're part of a community, they come back when you, when you then you can scale up also like we have this, these three groups. So we have people learning ID, we have people learning JOSM. So there's like way also how they can grow in their mapping and then they can come to Ralph and learn how to validate. So we have also the system of making people grow, like making part of, of, a, of a long thing. So for us, for me, Mapathons is not a one-off thing. It's a long-term sustainable thing. And it's also only then that the quality of the data grows. So one time mapper, yeah, good. But if you come the second time, yes, really good. Then only the data goes better and better and better. So within MSF, we also, we also had the trouble that 
a lot of our MSF offices are wanting to organize mapathons. So this, th we were also a bit like in crisis. So my colleague Jan is also there. So we are the two like, okay, what should we do about this? Because we are not able to, to maintain the quality high enough. These, they want just to organize one off mapathons to engage our MSF supporters. And that's not what we want from, from the data point of view also. We want quality data, we want long-term engagement. So we started to organize like training of trainings for our own staff who want to organize mapathons. So these were really three-day trainings to really learn them how to map um, on JOSM. Let's get them on JOSM. Let's do a mapathon together with the, with the community which is existing in Prague. We were doing this. So we really, but of course it's like, yeah, we did this for internally within MSF now. Maybe we should also just try to do something like this for Mapathon organizers. I'm not sure. Maybe, yeah, we could start thinking about this somehow, yeah. somewhere. Yeah, three days. Sorry for the long answer. Just be trained to run a Mapathon. That's cool. Um, Matt? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll hop on Ralph's question. Because um, you, you made a really good point. Um, part, part of your, your question I, or I might disagree with, but uh, on, on the other side, well, I'll get there. Um, so Ralph's question was, um, we've moved away from you know, projects that are mapping everything um, and more towards um, you know, buildings only or highways only. Um, I personally think that's a good thing. Um, when, you, when you have a project that's map buildings, map roads, map waterways, map land uses, um, not only do they never get completed, um, that you just end up with a whole mess of things. Um, by, by directing users uh, to a specific feature, um, and there, there's you know, new features coming out in, in the task manager, uh, one of which we're, we're trying to implement uh, working on at Maxar, where we can you know, limit, the, limit the features that users can actually, um, can actually create based on uh, what the project uh, or campaign is, is looking for. Um, and, and so I, I think that's you know, a very useful tool to have um, so you don't end up with a little bit of this and a little bit of that and you know, a waterway that's not connected to anything. Um, to, to your other point about you know, creating well-rounded mappers, you know, you're absolutely right that just knowing how to map buildings does not necessarily make you a well-rounded mapper. Um, but we need to be able to point users to either resources to learn more because you're not going to learn everything in a 90-minute mapathon. Um, there has to be some expectation that uh, people can, you know, take things and run with it. And not every mapper is going to return. Um, but if you get, I don't know, a, what's what's a good number? 20% to to return and be a repeat mapper? Like, do we want 50? I I don't know what the number is now, but it's probably a lot less than that. Um, you know, getting people to sort of um, become interested, use, use the mapathon to, you know, hook them in. Um, and that, that's actually how I, I kept continue mapping. I, I was unemployed and I'm like, oh yeah, the, that OSM thing was kind of cool. And so I just mapped my hometown from, uh, from my parents' couch while I was being lazy. <laughs> um, but it, but it worked. Um, and, and uh, you can't put that expectation on everyone, but having people go out and start to explore the wide world of OSM, which is a whole other thing because it's very decentralized, but it's also centralized. Um, but there's a lot of tools that people don't know about. So even having combined resources, um, which was sort of another question as well, um, you know, the Missing Maps site does, has some resources for starting to map uh, or learning how to validate. Um, so having a more central repository for just an entryway to OSM in general, um, I think is really helpful because um, the wiki can be difficult to manage too. Let's, uh, we, let's have the remaining panelists do one minute each and then we can um, see if there's any final comments and then we can go for lunch. Okay. Um, I think the, the focus on event organizers is exactly right and what kind of training and materials they get needs to be very well designed as well as be able to incorporate all the expertise here and continuous learning and experience. And it's not enough just to have something on a website. This really, these need to be, those folks need to be part of a network and have relationships with each other and with the people in this room. So it's very important to cultivate. 
And those organizers as well need to have a broader basket of things that people can do. Map swipe, of course, is one thing, but there's probably others that don't involve going as far as editing directly in OpenStreetMap as their first thing. Um, so that's worth thinking about what else event organizers can offer to people who are coming new to, um, to HOT and OSM. Shami? Uh, so I think almost everything has been mentioned, but just to talk about Ralph's comment on like, uh, making people map everything, I feel like sometimes if you are, if you make, if you make people work with so much data, remember this is, OSM is live data. Someone is going to maybe shift a boundary of a country or maybe a road or something. So sometimes if you target it and you can even easily help them, so you can tailor the training strictly for that. Marathon sometimes are like one hour only. And if you have so much, you'll get so little at the end of the day. Yes. My last comment is that we shouldn't sell OSM short by saying the you know, anyone can edit, and then the lie is it must be easy because anyone can edit. Mapping is difficult. I've been professionally doing it for several decades, and I still bump into issues and have to relearn some things. And we have to let it be known that it's hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone can do it, but it's a challenge. Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, lots and lots and lots of ideas. Um, Maggie just directed me to one resource where there is actually a lot of this stuff, but it seems like we should also document more there, which is Teach OSM. Um, but yeah, we seem to have loads of ideas and loads of people doing this. And so yeah, hopefully can have some more discussions and learn. I, go to London for the Mapathon once a year and I walk in and every time it's different and there's more people there and they're always doing exciting things. So yeah, we should be sharing these, these lessons more broadly. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to everyone for coming and, and let's go in and grab some lunch. Thanks.